Live from Pahrump, the Valley of the Dirt People, right, Logan? Yeah. How dirty are you today? Not very. Not Because you're not riding your dirt bike. No. Did you see that one question I had in there? Yes. Yeah, are you worried about that? Yeah. <laughs> this is Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, where we talk about motorcycle and motorcycle-related parts. My name is Jimmy Lewis. I'm the uh, team principal of Dirt Bike Test, which is the authority on motorcycle product testing. Um, I actually challenged my own authority today because uh, Honda released a whole bunch of information on the 2021 Sierra 450R, Sierra 450RX, and Sierra 450 Works Edition. And uh, we had our, our story all ready to go and some European uh, publications blew the embargo. So like we got an email about 45 minutes before our embargo. It's like, okay, you can drop your info. And so I had to switch some stuff because I had it all programmed to automatically go up there. And uh, this is the life that we that we live. We get we got about twenty four hours to digest the information and produce our content. We we saw it yesterday. This is how the media works now. Usually, you would get like a month or two embargoed information when you worked at a print publication, so you could get it in print when they wanted the information to be released. Now they're going to release it today, so they give it to you yesterday and say. Here's your stuff. Uh, do your homework, which means I was kind of planning to go riding or something like that, and that meant I couldn't go. Actually, I wasn't going to go riding. It's too stinking hot out here. Yeah. So um, I was doing that, and then I and then as it evolved, I saw uh, on my Facebook feed because I was kind of putting our story up on Facebook and sending out on Twitter and you know doing all that stuff, the the social media managing of it. One from Dirt Rider popped up. That's the magazine I used to run for about eight years of my life, uh, back when I was Logan's age. So um, uh, I said, I wonder what Dirt Rider said. <laughs> and after after being bombarded with some banner ads that I had to click out of the way, I, I got to their thing. And they basically put a picture of each bike in about three or four words and said, this is the new this and this is the new that. And I'm like are you kidding me? Is that where they've gone? And so then I scrolled down to the next story and it was a picture of Ivan Tedesco's factory KTM 450. I think that's what it was. I don't remember. It was, it was some factory bike from about seven to 10 years ago, or I, I don't, it was like, what, ha what has happened over there? So I actually challenged, I said, I said, if this story doesn't give me any information, check this one out. And then I posted a link to dirt bike tests <laughs> story straight up there. Cause you know, I'll, I'll go head to head with them. I don't care. So uh, we'll see how that works out. I'm probably going to be banned from, uh, as an ex editor of dirt rider magazine, I'm probably going to be banned from uh, uh, making comments on their, on their site. But the, I'm sure the small Indian, uh, <laughs> The, the company that they have over there that they that they now have uh, managing their social media will figure me out. <laughs> uh, so how's things going, Logan? Good. Who's our who's our main sponsor tonight? KTM. KTM. And do you have something to say about KTM? Yes. Okay, good. I want to see if you can do this by heart right oh now. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Powered by a distinct ready-to-race mentality, KTM is um, leading in... You're getting, you're good. The world's world, leading high world, performance, street and off-road. Yes. Sport. Keep going. You can go. Motorcycle manufacturer. And... I'm going to let you look at it for two seconds and you got to read the rest. Just give, give it a quick read through there. This is memorizing. It's part of school. See, since you're not in school right now, I'm gonna I'm tasking myself with making sure that you're gonna learn something, at least anytime you're around me. And we're gonna work on memorization today. Okay, where are their headquarters? Uh, Marietta, California. And that's North American headquarters, right? Yes. And uh, over the years, what has KTM built? A distinct ready to race mentality. Uh huh. And a reputation with every. Mo product it makes and every move it makes. Pretty close. Okay. <laughs> that was better than the regular read, wasn't it? Hey, George, how do we do there? 
Um, okay. Uh, hey, Mason, tell, tell your mom thanks, by the way. Uh, tonight's t- tequila. Everybody wants to know. We don't have any tacos because uh, the bar is uh, the bar is closed. So yeah, bars closed in Nevada again. So that means that um, uh, you don't get the dollar tacos. You have to pay full price for tacos. I didn't realize this. The last few times I bought tacos, they were instead of being a dollar piece, they're like four bucks a piece. So uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday on the budget that we have here. Um, had to, um, you know, wind it back a little bit. So um, you need those bars to open up because that makes the food cheap because people uh, spend money in the bars and then they can offer cheap food. And then Taco Tech Tuesday is uh, in a better state. Uh, Tim Marshall or Maria Marshall, I can't tell which one, is there from Washington State. I'm wondering where is our Alaska representative? (laughs) Where is... Um, I'm trying to remember the name. I can't remember the name now. It's Matt's, Matt's, uh, uncle. Um, uh, you know, when Matt's here, he rides, he rides, uh, (laughs) the bikes over. He's always riding the 950 or the 650. (laughs) It's, uh, oh, somebody will remind me. George, help. (laughs) Um, okay. What's the next question, Logo? What, what should we... Oh, what, we got to say thanks to uh, Climb, right? You're not, yes. wearing, you're not wearing a Climb t-shirt tonight. I'm wearing a Climb hat. Yeah. I didn't wear any Climb gear today. It's strange, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, climb makes good dirt bike gear, and I, I, I've been fully lacking on uh, getting the winner chosen for the Climb uh, Show Us Your Junk contest uh it's on me i've just been busy working on other things like uh financing this whole operation (laughs) so bob you should probably put your mask back on do we need to do a temperature check on you yeah (laughs) um we have uh we have the peanut gallery in here it's gonna you know help us when we say things wrong like chris reels uh name improperly and uh we should, what should we do? Go straight to the chat room. Pull the questions off there, huh, Logan? Yeah. Okay, Chris Smith got the first one in. What's the deal with the 2021 Honda CR450 based on the 2020 only being $8,600? That's cheaper than the 2020 model. Where are these left? Were these leftovers in the factory? Well, that's a good question. I heard that they, well, they specifically told me, and I'm just repeating what I was told, that they did another production run of the 2020. So it's not a 2021. It's actually the 2020 completely unchanged. There's a whole nother production run. Now I'm going to, maybe I'll dig in a little bit deeper and tell you what I might think, but it has nothing to do with what might actually be true. Um, So in the United States, bike sales are great right now. Bikes are flying off the shelves. Uh, but I would suspect that there's a lot of places in the world that may not have that same thing. So maybe there is a totally an, an whole nother production run. Maybe there's a whole bunch of bikes all over the world that can be sent over here where we can sell them. I don't know. But anyways, the reason they knocked the price down is they said they wanted it to be more affordable um, and... I think it would be about the same amount they would knock the price down if they were sitting on dealer showrooms floors and it doesn't cost any more to make. They're just going to make more of them and sell them. So it's not a, it, it is just a re-release of the 2020 CR 450 and that's the deal. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Kyle McCoy says, Jimmy Lewis, have you ever run a hundred miles at once? If so, is it harder or easier than Dakar? That's a trick question. Um, uh, Kyle, uh, we're not going to turn this into ultra running show because I hardly even run anymore. The only reason I run anymore is for beer. Uh, and I got one sitting right next to me, so I don't have to run very far for that. Right, Logan? Nope. Okay. You were ready to hit that KTM read again without looking. Oh, boy. Nope. No, you don't have to. Uh, Dallas Theobald says, racing the Vegas Torino for the first time. I race NHHA and other local series on a 350 XCF. Would Jimmy race the Vegas Torino on a 350 or a Honda CR450X? Uh, CR450X, 100%. 
Uh, reason being is I would race uh, a BMW 1200 in that. And in fact, I have. <laughs> so I raced a, H a BMW HP2. Was that 1100? I can't remember anymore. HP2 is 1200, 1100. Memory doesn't serve me well right now. But um, that you want the fastest bike you can, probably geared as tall as you can gear it because there won't be any place in that course other than leaving the pits uh, when you'll be in first gear. So if you can go about 45 miles an hour in first gear idling, uh, and that would be ideal. So bigger bike. Although the good thing about the KTM 350 is it does have a six speed. And I knew some guys, vets actually, and I know I know uh, Dallas. Uh, he's, he's not he's not a he's not Logan's age or anything. That raced a KTM 350 in Baja because they felt they went faster on it because it was really rough and bumpy. But Vegas Torino for the first bikes is butter smooth. They have graded the entire course they graded after the event and it's very very fast so uh more power to you on that one got any other ones logan you see any ones no nice oh, job see. with the captions uh, logan you're typing in the, the the captions for people no because <laughs> <laughs> it, it automatically i see every once in a while it pops up on my on my thing where the you know the closed captions come up and yeah I've been told by people who use that um, that it's really, really good. So let's see. Do you think trials riding is the best possible base training for any rider? Asked Kyle McCoy. Now we're on track here. Now we're asking some good questions. Uh, yes. Um, I don't think it's it's going to help you anything with, with speed or anything that has to do with speed, but it will help you with your bike technique which has a lot to do with a balance and then b traction and traction revolves around throttle control and clutch control and brake control all of which you have to do a lot on a trials bike so it'll just tune up your tune up your senses hey and speaking of trials bike that montessa that i have bob the battery the osa oh yeah osa it's all spanish to me um I left the key on and the battery went dead. Is that battery rechargeable? It's just a two cell LI battery, so I don't know. Don't know, yeah. I cause I gotta figure out how to get some power back in that thing. It, I was having hard startings. I needed to uh I needed to do something. If you want to know about that OSA, now that I know remember what it is, uh there's a test on dirt bike test. It was one of the very first fuel injected two strokes, and because Bob is a sucker. Um, I mentioned something about it and he went and bought one. And speaking of suckers, I saw, actually it was on dirt bike magazines, um, website. They had a, they've taken an old Husky 430 auto engine and stuffed it into a modern, oh, three, it was a three speed one. I didn't, yeah. Late model. So they stuffed it into a uh, modern day Husky chassis. And uh, I sent that to Bob too, and he's probably nine thousand dollars less rich. Did you did you order one? Did you try to buy one? Uh, not yet. Not. I just spend more money. Somebody will make them for you. Three D printing, Bob. It's the future. They they're printing pistons these days. So <laughs> whatever you need for that, like Porsche's printing vintage parts for Porsches because they can do them one by one. And so I'm sure they can print whatever Husky auto transmission part that you need. Um, and Kel Postel helped me out there. The HP2 uh, was a 1200. So I was correct in my first guess. You know what HP2 is, Logan? He used to run Baja. <laughs> Did you do the reading that I sent you? I sent you some reading. The The homework. Homework, yes. Yeah. So you know all about the 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 2021 Hondas. Yes. Okay. You, you, so you could actually tell us all about them. Mostly. Mostly. <laughs> okay. So correct me when I start making uh making mistakes. Um, and you only reason you know about the HP2 and Baja is you're reading the comments. Yes. <laughs> Cheater. 
Okay, let's get to the questions on the sheet here. I'll let you read those. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Rottweiler Performance. Uh, they make awesome KTM aftermarket parts. They hosted us for a Tech Talk Taco Tuesday a few weeks ago. We had a great time down there. Um, their products are definitely better than the audio quality of the show from that location. So uh, if you want really trick things for KTM Adventure Bikes, they make them. And you might want to check out Rottweiler Performance on the internets and then your ball, your uh, wallet may be as light as Bob's. <laughs> First question. Um, Eric, what is your opinion on fatty 90, 121 front tires? I ride a variety of terrain, desert, mountain, single track, and the fatty tire seems to work good in the sand, but I feel like I give up some in the ruts and corners. I want to try the Kinda Gauntlet 90-90-21 front tire. Do you have any experience on this tire? Thank you for a great show. Uh, thanks, Eric. Pronounce his last name. Her Majestad? Her Ma... <laughs> Herge... Her... Hergeman... Her... Hergeman... Stat... Okay. Eric, phonetically spell that out in uh, in the chat room or something like that, or someone else can. Oh, you know, I didn't share this with George, so George is flying blind tonight. Um, I'm going to send it to you right now, George. Uh, I have no experience with the uh, the Kenda gauntlet. Um, that's an extreme enduro tire, and um, I sh- probably should have, but I uh, didn't. So uh, I can't compare it to that one. I run Kenda Parker uh, DT almost exclusively, and – I always say it's because the braking performance, and that's the case. Uh, and I have run the the larger front tire specifically. The one that I thought was the best was the the I'll think of it um, golden uh, golden tire made a front tire and makes a, a an oversized front tire, and it's really good. It does get better than average traction, and and in sand it floats a little bit which for some people is really good and other people it's not. It just depends on wh- how, you know, you're riding. But it also can be a little bit grabby on ruts and some different stuff. I don't like I don't like when it adds a weight feel and I do remember that the Golden didn't add that much weight feel for the extra bonus traction you got and so I thought it was a pretty good tire and I have a few friends that ha- are running those all the time. They love them. So um, take that for what it's worth. I'm uh, like I always have to tell you, uh, Kenda does uh, support and help my off-road riding schools, and uh, but I would run Kenda Parker DTs if I were paying with my own money because they are really uh, good tires for what I do, especially out here in the West. So, you think I answered his question, Logan? Yeah. Should he give me a thumbs up? Yes. Okay. Uh, but. Yeah, it's in the it well. So, you, but if let's see, I ride a variety of train and I give up some in the ruts and the corners. I'm just kind of trying to overanalyze this question now. So, ruts is where the fat tires can tend to suffer because a lot of times they'll try to climb out of the ruts. So, if you're having a problem uh, not being able to climb out of the ruts, maybe a fat tire would help. Where if you're if you just having a problem with the ruts, then I'm going to blame the rider more than the tire, first of all. And then second, um, uh, I know that they're not that popular in the tight technical single track communities. Uh, It's more for the desert off-road rider, just uh, in my experience. So, yeah, Eric, uh, good luck with that. What does Craig want to know? Craig Uh, Alberts. Do we need to wear face masks for Tech Talk Taco Tuesday? Or will the amount of alcohol consumed be enough to keep us and others safe? Well, you're not consuming alcohol, so no. you're very, definitely unsafe from that thing. Uh, Bob uh, walked in with a face mask, and I've seen him touching his face a bunch, so he's he's doomed. Um, I told him to wear a respirator because I don't want him bringing anything in here. Um, I meant everyone except our families as they will still have to put up with us jabbering about Jimmy's life versus ours all night. Uh, you're jealous of me? 
You should come in here and edit video for me, Craig, because that's not any fun. And I'm trying to get my uh, my Yamaha Tenere 700 video with uh, my beautiful wife, Heather, as my uh, co-tester on that. Um, and I almost got it done, but it's tough. And guess, guess what's what's the next guy's name? Um, Chris Real. Real. Okay, that's that's right. What does he want to know? Jimmy, please check the new bike spec sheet and confirm or compare the maximum rated RPM. Did the bike adjust the power delivery range from years past? Uh, so I'm checking my phone right now because I did send some text messages out. And I got, uh, imagine this, no response. <laughs> so I think, the, I think the media guys are uh, busy answering probably more dumb questions than that. Uh, so I could not, um, I think that over in Europe, and I didn't do a ton of research on, on this, but I think over in Europe they got a better um, press kit or they had some more information because those guys were talking about you know shifts in power at certain RPMs and stuff. Uh, my inclination is that they didn't raise the rev limit on that bike, but I don't know for sure. But I think they um, did try to play around with the, the power delivery. When they start talking about rideability, it's funny because Honda has always built very, very rideable engines uh, on, on the 450s to the point where they were called slow. And over the past few years, because they were called slow, which they weren't, they just didn't feel fast. Uh, they started tuning the power up to feel faster and kind of give it more of a hit, which um, seemed to work in some aspects, but in others it didn't. In other words, it probably made the bike feel faster, but it didn't necessarily equate to lap times. And this bike is a bike that you're supposed to get good lap times on. So I think they're trying to fill in, maybe fill in kind of the holes, maybe with more power. Uh, to make it more drivable so that the numbers on the dyno look good, which is kind of a really a bad way to start chasing your tail. So, uh, and I don't think that they need to increase the rev limit on a 450 because I don't know very many people that actually hit the rev limiter on a 450, uh, especially in the proper gear going the speed that they should be going. So, that's just a personal take on that. So I'm not sure. I, I will try to get those answers for you, Chris, and uh, we'll go after that. Then we then we have uh, we have Victor. So after using the Africa Twin again this week and trying to work the left side thumb board, what are your op opinions now? Well, I'm going to need a few more weeks on that bike <laughs> to, to teach my thumb uh, where to go without having to think about it. Because it's complicated. And I think like I spoke about like last week on the show is like a lot of times we don't get a a ton of time on a particular bike. We maybe some some bikes and we'll never do a test on a bike in a single day. We'll do a riding impression. But when you're doing a riding impression, especially on a bike that has so many modes, uh, it takes a little while to learn. And so I'm still learning. I Now I know how, to, how that thing functions. I know what it does and how to do it. But now that there's uh, three levels of wheelie control and eight levels, actually four levels of wheelie control because you can turn it off, eight levels of traction control, seven, and you can turn it off, and then different modes that you can activate those things in, I'm still playing around with. So I've been taking it out. I took it out a few nights this week and just went and played around and it's a whole different bike when I can turn everything off. No wheelie control and no traction control. And here's the interesting thing about that bike. So when I really struggled with it the other uh, night when I was riding back here because I, I did not know how to turn off the wheelie control specifically and the traction control. There's, there's, a, there's a method to it, and I just didn't know how to click the buttons properly. I was riding the bike up a hill that was at an angle that pissed off the computer because it thought the bike was doing a wheelie. Everybody get me on this. So, so wow. I was riding up a hill that, you know, and not, and, and when you're in wheelie control, I think three is the maximum. And, and this is where I, I always get confused. I think three is the, 
the maximum amount of wheelie control, and that's what it might have been in. And it just the front wheel does not have to be that high off the ground before it says, "Hey, you're doing a wheelie. I'm going to do something to make it so the wheelie doesn't happen." I was trying to ride up a hill, and it didn't like it, so it wouldn't give me the power I needed to go up the hill. Bob raised his hand. That's see how he did that, Logan. That's like an almost like you're in school. <laughs> Pitch yes. Yeah, pitch angle and lean angle. That's what these computers and these bikes do these days. Like le- lean angle ABS. Oh, I did some development on one of these systems. It's amazing. Like you can you can you can on on some of the adventure bikes with the lean angle ABS, you can come in and you can just stab your front brake out of balance. Not not in a straight line. Like you can lean the bike over and stab the front brake and it will only activate it enough to slow the bike down. It won't let it let it slide out. It knows it's starting to slide out. That's how good this stuff is. Um, and in fact, that's why, especially on some of the bikes that have off-road ABS, and the Honda has this, where you can never turn off the front ABS. You can turn off the rear. But since it has lean angle sensing, sensing, and I haven't got to that level on this bike where I'm willing to kind of throw it into a turn and stab the front brake to see how good it really is. On another brand, when I did testing, that's what we were doing. You You were literally going around a turn on a gravel road and you would stab the front brake. And this is, this is in development time where sometimes it didn't, sometimes it didn't work. It's the stupidest thing ever, but that's what you had to do. They had to, and, and the problem was, and then they had to use bad riders by the way, to do this, but they also had to use good riders because they wanted to see. So we do it both with the system on and the system off. And there was data acquisition on the bike. And, they wanted to see what a good rider did to correct it with it off so they could make the system do that when it was on. It kind of catch me on that. So you had to go do some stupid stuff and maybe not kind of crash, but they, the reason they'd have a good rider do it with it on is to see how you would react when the system started working. You literally got in fights with this thing. I mean, it was like, it was weird. It, it, it's, it's, it, that's why I, I don't like it and I like it because I know they're trying to make it better, but everybody reacts a little bit different and then they have to look at all the parameters and figure out, okay, where's the, how do we make this thing autopilot? You know, you know what I like about that Africa twin is has cruise control on it and I can take my hands off the handlebars when I'm riding down the highway and just crew. No, no, I'm not, not for texting. It shows you how out of balance you really are because the bike starts turning and you think, oh, I'm totally balanced. I'm going straight. And you take your hands off the bars and you don't realize how much that handlebar input is affecting what's going on. So um, I remember BMW used to have cruise control, or they still do. They had cruise control on some of their, their parallel twin boxers. It would always pull to the right. <laughs> you'd have to ride down the <laughs> you'd have to ride down the road leaning to the left to keep it going straight. So uh uh, you learn something new on Tech Talk Taco Tuesday every Tuesday, don't you, Logan? Yes. So you're gonna go. You're going on a little vacation, right? Yeah. So how's kid life going? Good. Good. So you, you're, you've got you've you've uh, got all your medical insurance paid up. You've you've made the house payment. Um, your car insurance is paid. Everything's good like that. Think so. You think so. <laughs> just checking because that's a, that's the stuff that you don't have to think about no. yet, not yet. Yep, just checking. It's because if I if I didn't have to do that, I'd be I'd be watering Jimmy's flat track like at about two o'clock on every Tuesday, so we could go rip some laps before we do this show. Because then then nothing would work when we'd roll in here, and then I'd have an excuse, right? Yeah. Because I've been sitting over there uh, working on that computer, and I should have been. You know, actually, I did. I got everything ready this time. Um, we're going to go to our YouTube questions now. Uh, so if you wonder how you can get your questions answered on the show, of course, you can uh, do it live in our chat room on Facebook. You, uh, that's with the video. You click on the video and um, ask some questions there. We usually go to those first. Uh, if you watch this show on YouTube, but you may be watching it on YouTube right now, it's like, hey, just... Go down below, and there's places to answer, ask questions. You can leave comments. You can tell 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 me how awesome I am. And, of course, those are the comments that I cut and um, paste. Bob calls it the Jimmy Lewis show now. You notice I put my own logo up there, right? You did? Yeah. See? You're not paying attention, Bob. You know you fell asleep in the show once. 
Yeah. Um, no, that, that was the one time we caught you. Um, so you can put your comments down there. We go over those, uh, pull them out, answer them. A lot of times we'll even go back and answer them on that post or we'll say, hey, watch the next show. Uh, when you're listening to us on a podcast, I think the best thing for you to do then is to, let's see, yell at whatever device is um, uh, streaming your podcast. Say, Jimmy, answer my motorcycle question. And then uh, what it's like, uh, Alexa or something. And then somehow I'm pretty sure that these devices are smart enough where it'll send me that question. I don't know how you're going to do it. If you're listening to it on a podcast, uh, watch the show live and answer it there and get our numbers up. Hey, and if you're enjoying this information, please share this stuff with your friends because, uh, the t-shirt sales aren't going too well and we're running low on some supplies and that's not going to keep the doors open around here. We're going to need to get some more sponsors. And when we tell sponsors, all of our numbers, uh, they go, well, that's really not a lot of people. <laughs> so, uh, more people would be better. Um, does that sound good to you, Logan? Yes. Okay. What's the, what's the first YouTube question? Um, rider S Oregon. I don't like the ride wide ratio transmission. The mountain dirt roads around here, a dangerous to ride fast. Okay, so uh, he had a second question, I, I believe, as well. But Yes. So you're blaming the wide ratio transmission for the speed you're going on a mountain road. I think that's backwards. I think, I think, the, I think your wrist, <laughs> if you're using your transmission to limit the speed that you're going on a mountain road, um, there's a reason why they put throttle stops in bikes, isn't there? <laughs> I, I got it. I'm going to... Somebody told me today I should start a store. I'm going to start selling stuff that everybody else doesn't sell. I'm going to start selling throttle stops for bikes because, I mean, sounds like somebody needs them. <laughs> so uh, so you're, you basically do not – if you don't need – if you don't want to ride – if you don't want to ride fast on a mountain road, uh, I would just turn the throttle less. But you can suffer when you have the opportunity to go fast. Um. No way. Everybody should have a close ratio transmission because you shouldn't go fast on the... When I'm out in the desert, when I'm going on a downhill valley, I want sixth gear. I want that thing to be taped. Like, I want at least it to feel sort of like I'm on a Husaberg 570. Hey, have I ever told you about my Husaberg, Logan? <laughs> Do you know how fast that thing is? Like, that's what... And it has a six-speed transmission in it. And I mean, there's no limit. Like it's really rare you get to see the top of that. And if there were mountain roads, like he should think he should be careful that I'm not coming the other way, because <laughs> because uh, my six speed transmission would make me go too fast. So okay, what's his next question? Um, I ride, I off road my KX250 on technical mountain trails. My trail rides are typically 40 miles. After I'm tired, so I don't need a bigger tank. Not far from 60 years old. If I was going to ride desert or race, I would be just buy a bigger tank. In the desert, I would want a bigger motor anyway. So he's talking. He's he's responding to our comments and stuff on the uh, KX450 XC and KX250. Uh, posts from uh, last week, XC. So um, how do you get tired in – oh, you're 60. Is he, you supposed to get tired when you're 60? Well, yeah. Yeah? Okay. I don't know. I'm not there yet. I've, I'm still learning. Um, I'm not going to get tired when I'm riding. I, I think uh, it's, it's, I'd just be another ad for my damn riding school that we're shut down. But in October, you can come and visit us, and I can tell you how not to get tired on a motorcycle. Um, it's not rocket science either. Um, if, it, uh, uh, I, there's a reason why they sell the bikes with the smaller tanks a lot of times. And I, I always complain about fuel range because I have a problem. I ride too much. I ride places where there's no gas tanks. I don't come back to my truck. So I guess I'm on the other side of the spectrum and I, I try not to let that bleed into, the opinion too heavy, but it always seems to because the worst thing ever is when I have to carry gas or run out of gas. Um, 
I have a gas bag that you know, it's like every time I go riding a stock bike, I have to carry a gallon of gas with me in order to get back because we do 50 and 60 mile loops. And, and luckily it's mostly downhill on the way back. And when we realize we're in deep, you know, poo poo, we can idle and cruise back, uh, at least to a gas station in this area. So, um, th- yeah, and I think I think that on the on the Kawasaki specifically, you know, unlike the Honda 450RX, the new 2021 CR450RX that has a bigger gas tank and it has different suspension valving and it has different ECU, Kawasaki is just kind of dabbling into this market. They're changing shock springs and and um, not doing a ton of stuff. They're trying to they're just trying to offer another another offering. Uh, with you know to, to make it kind of an XC, so hopefully that bike works out for you. Um, I'm sorry I complained. <laughs> Why do you want a bigger motor? Oh, you want a bigger motor than your KX250? That's going to make you more tired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Rider S Oregon. You think that's his real name? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the same. Uh, we have some. Oh wait, um, Kelly Fort says I'm sold. I had an 08 KTM XCW and loved it. This one he's talking about the KTM 300 sounds a million times better. So since he sold Logan and he sold because of my video, that means I sold a KTM. Yes. So it's smart for KTM to help dirt bike test and Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. Yes. Because they do what? Remarkable global success. Yes. Yeah, you got to remember these key words. High performance street and off-road motorcycle manufacturer. Reflected in every product it develops and every move it makes. You know what what KTM tagline I used in my Yamaha video today? Ready to race. <laughs> you have to watch the video. It, it, it might be up tonight. I don't know. I got to do some stuff for another thing I'm working on. Um, okay. We have some KTM uh, 390 questions. Um, you know what I got, Logan? Did I tell you this? Somebody sent me an ECU and an airbox, an air filter. Maybe it's airbox cover for this bike for more power, power up. Kubler, Kuber, Kuber USA, C O O B E R USA has a power. They had it already. I have a power up kit for this bike. So I have it. It's in the garage. When are you going to mount it on the bike? Probably before I leave. Okay. So tomorrow. <laughs> At what time? Because I'm holding you to this. Um, it's, 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 I'll tell you what it is. It's one plug and six or eight bolts. And you're, you're on your way to KTM horsepower heaven. Yes. Okay, well, we'll check. That's what we're going to do. We're going to test it. Okay, first question. Um, Say his name. Manuel. Man. Manoj. Best motor, motorbike review seen so far on YouTube. Yeah. How's that? So yeah. I, never, I never just load up the comments, all the <laughs> positive ones. Uh, Manoj K is probably from India because I've been told now that I'm uh, – a very respected motorcycle journalist in India. Although they those guys don't know how to run a website, as uh, indicated by Dirt Bike Test. Uh, no, not Dirt Bike Test. <laughs> dirt Rider. It's all dirt to me. Uh, yeah, Dirt Rider. The the guys that are running that. You got to go talk to them. Um, what does the next guy say? And say his um, name. <laughs> Mister or Mrs. Rahman. Huh? I don't even have that one. What? It's it's right below. It's isn't she Shinur Raman? Yeah. Oh, it's Mr. or Mrs. Yes. Uh, let me see your sheet. <laughs> no, it's it's that. I oh, just... it's. Oh, oh, Mr. Oh, you don't know if that's a man or a woman's name. No. What's the first name? Say it. Shah. Shahman. Shah. Shah. Inu. Er. Newer, say ramen, <laughs> like you know, it's almost like top ramen, but same thing. Whatever. Okay, go ahead. Um, change the front fifteen, front fifteen tooth 
to 14 tooth from Duke 250. Gives a good low range torque. So I can see that I can see that help happening. I can see that helping on that bike, um, dropping from a fifteen to a fourteen, because uh, the, the the transmission is a little bit little bit gappy, but not too bad. But you know what you're getting tomorrow with that thing? More power. Right, and then you don't need that sprocket change. No. We hope. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll test it. We'll let you know. Um, bearded ranch. Rancher. Rancher. Uh, this is a the best review I've seen. This bike is for sure needed. Needed spoked wheels. I'd be passed if I spent near to eight grand on a bike and the wheel bent the first time I took it out. They need to address that and offer it an op- optional for the same price. Well, thanks for the compliment, Bearded Rancher. Um, and I don't think he'd be passed. I think he'd be pissed. But he spelled it that way, so it's not your fault, Logan. Hey, everybody, oh. <laughs> you, you we, we've had other people try to read the, the the questions, and I don't think I don't think anybody's done any better than you. Not that not that I can do any better than you either. It's not that easy, no. No. Okay, so if you want your question read on Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, Logan uh, requests that you uh, spell it properly, um, punctuate it uh, properly so he can uh, make the sentences connect, and then give us the uh, phonetic spelling of your name. Uh, Those in, people don't ride dirt bikes. Oh, they don't <laughs> ride dirt bikes? Those kind of people? Those people that's what, kind of, what, kind of, what kind of those people are dirt bike riders, Bob? They can't spell. Right, they, they can't, can't read. Can't read. Man, and I'm going to try to write to these people. Uh, so um, 8,000 on a bike and the wheel bent the first time I took it out. Well, it didn't bend the first time I took it out. It took me like three times to take it out, and I'm pretty sure I hit something harder than I should have. So, But we were testing it. We were pushing it. But it doesn't take much to smack a rock on a road uh, and bend a wheel. And I know that KTM Hard Parts is working on wheel sets, and I've had our bike at uh, W Wheels, and they are looking at it, but the hub is a little bit hard to come by, the hub on you know for a spoked wheel at this, at this time. So there's a market out there for it, but um, wheels aren't cheap either. So, yeah. So Cooper USA is, is our, is our uh, sponsoring our KTM 390 uh, <laughs> uh, tech talk tonight uh, we'll tell you how that thing works out and uh, now since you probably watch this on Facebook and you're going to start getting Kuber ads or something <laughs> uh, okay uh, next next question Logan uh, JD Jetting guns, cars, bikes, cigars okay you can't have three of those four things you know no which one do you want don't say cigars. No. <laughs> bikes. Bikes. Got it. Yeah. Um, there was another guy who worked here who didn't like bikes, and now he likes cars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll see how that went. Um, go ahead. Will this eliminate the jerk off on jerky <laughs> off on third throttle <laughs> transmission on the new KTM SXR F bike? This riding through pits <laughs> in hey, second gear. Hey, he's pretty much reading it the way it was, it was written. <laughs> he's, he's correcting on the fly. I mean, like, like probably 70% of what sounds like a slip-up is, is him correcting it on the fly and getting it mostly right. Okay. I thought Logan was an English major at Pro JC. Uh, are you? You major in English? No. You got to get me. We got to get that contact for somebody to come in and start editing this stuff. Uh, so he says it's like riding through the pits in second gear. It just bucks back and forth as you try to maintain a smooth throttle on off. Okay, so let's just let's just do a breakdown on this uh, this sentence here. Like riding through pits in second gear, it just bucks back and forth as you try to maintain smooth throttle on and off. How do you maintain smooth throttle on and off? 
Yeah. Do you try to go on and off to maintain a smooth throttle or is you're holding the throttle, is it bucking back and forth? I, I think it's the second thing. It's you're trying to hold steady throttle. Um, so number one, never ever, quite possibly in the future, never judge a high performance race bike while you're riding it through the pits <laughs> because the throttle performance is not going to be good for doing that. It's meant to lunge and surge. That throttle response is meant to loft the front wheel and to huck the bike off of jumps, which doesn't equate to riding across the parking lot because it's essentially trying to do the same thing in the parking lot, almost even at steady throttle, if that makes sense. It the, the, the bikes are tuned such that wherever you are in the throttle, it wants you to yank the throttle and go. It's getting ready to go. And so if you even move the throttle one or two percent, it senses go and it does that. And more than likely, even riding through the pits, you're moving the throttle one or two or three or five or seven percent. And every time you do it, it's going. And then you go up and you turn it back and then you lunge forward and then you turn it again. You And so if you actually just taped your throttle, uh, the views expressed by the host in this show are only his views, and I'd not recommend any place. If you actually tape the throttle at a steady throttle position and took your hands off the handlebars, provided you have enough balance to maintain that, um, the bike would not lunge or jerk or huggy buck. Uh, it's it's you changing the throttle positions is kind of what you're feeling. Will the JD jetting tuner eliminate it? Back to your original question. Guns, cars, bikes, cigars. You can actually take a lot of that out. And the easy way is to add fuel because richer fuel uh, tends to give the bike the sensation of more traction. And it kind of slows down the throttle response a little bit. So if you add fuel, especially in the low range, so that would be the green zone, and then also in the throttle pump range, which I think is, um, I've been using a couple different tuners of different brands that do different stuff, but I believe it's blue-green. I think it's the fourth button. If you add fuel there, it will richen it up and it will kind of slow the um, slow the th throttle response down a little bit. Now, if you have the ability to adjust ignition timing, that would be a lot more effective. And if you retarded the ignition, and I'm not saying that as a, as a, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a special needs ignition. It's just a, it's, I want you to retard the ignition. Um, it will decrease the throttle response as well. But on the JD tuner, you have no control over ignition. Like for instance, uh, and if you notice that on the KTM, if you, the SXF has, I didn't tell me what year, but, you know, sometimes there's a more aggressive ignition and a least aggressive ignition. Sometimes the whatever position is the least, the lesser ignition advance would also help that situation a little bit. But you shouldn't be judging that bike in the parking lot. If it's doing that on the track, uh, boy, um, yeah, the tuner will help. But I would be willing to bet that, that you might actually be better off on on uh, on the XCF because it's tamed down a little bit, so maybe an XCF black box could really help you out, um, and or put a quieter muffler on the bike, uh, like get an FMFQ and put it on the bike, and especially if you have a JD tuner because then you can then you can really tune the bike down, and that way the throttle response isn't so gnarly as we put it. It's just more effective. So you'll actually turn the throttle a little bit farther and you'll get the drive you want. It won't start uh, jerking you around uh, back and forth on the bike. Uh, Logan, I think I need to go back to the uh, the chat room to see what question. Have I missed a lot of questions? Um, You've been busy reading all the, all the questions. <laughs> wow. There's a lot of questions tonight. Um, Christian says, Jimmy, recommendations on dual sport desert boots, which are better, i.e. cooler for heat, hot feet. 
I need new boots. Currently run Alpine Stars Tech Sixes. I was hoping to reduce the itchy lower legs for days after riding. Also, a recommendation on good socks to help with sweat management. Well, for socks, I'm going to um, say I've run the Climb socks uh, quite a bit, which are good. And there's another company called Moto Skivvies. And we have a test up on those on Dirt Bike Test. And I believe they'll even ship them to you for free if you click on the link down there. Uh, Moto Skivvies has a compression sock that that vents. And there was another sock called Tech Socks, and I believe they went out of business, but they were really good as well. So the sock and socks do play a big role in this. As far as boots go, um, like with helmets, boots are very susceptible to the size of your foot and fit and everything. But probably the most vented boots I've worn have been the Alpine Stars Tech 8s, and they actually make a vented one, I believe. I think they actually sell it. I, I know it used to be kind of something that they only gave to factory riders, but it was the most it was the most vented boot that you could uh, get your hands on, and uh, it actually worked. And I knew because I was racing a BMW that had cylinders right in front of my feet, and I had the issue of my feet getting warm uh, as you uh, kind of suggested. But I don't know if I would necessarily go with a you know like a dual sport type of boot. A lot of the dual sport boots are Gore-Tex. And your feet, I think your feet sweat a little bit more than Gore-Tex will evacuate, especially out through a thick boot, so I wouldn't go down that road. I believe that you can also, here's another trick that I've done. I've actually drilled holes in the soles of my boot before um, in certain spots where there were spots that are not pressure spots that actually added some venting and, and it didn't seem like it affected the structure of the boot because my feet really sweated that much and it did, it did help. Uh, but I don't know if you want to do that, but it also could not wear those boots when I was riding where I was doing stream crossings or stuff like that. And your feet do get pretty dirty inside of them, which actually might be a problem as well. Um, the Tech Seven, I think, is a is a cooler boot. Also, um, the Tech Six is a price point boot, isn't it? It's a lower price boot. Tech Seven might be a little bit better, uh, but I bet you you're going to see the biggest improvement just from socks. You know, getting a good quality um, sock. So you see where we're at, Logan. On there, Cody is our next question. You're good. To that. I'll get this one, Ooh, Cody. Sadler asks, what would it take to get District 37 Desert Racing back to what it was when you were racing Desert and Long before? Love that you guys are doing. Love what you guys are doing. Hope this question hasn't been asked before. Um, no, it, it actually hasn't. <laughs> um, so, number one, the biggest struggle for District 37 Desert Racing is land closures. Uh, the, the areas that you guys... Uh, are racing in are substantially smaller than the areas I was able to race in when I was younger. Um, believe it or not, in the last year or two, uh, it has gotten better. There's actually some new areas that have been opened up, uh, but you have to really search uh, for them to learn about uh, where they are. And 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 then because of that, a lot of people started started getting you know club membership dropped. People got lazy with making courses. Um, Areas got smaller. It was, just, it was, and then, and then at the same time, some of this Grand Prix style racing started taking off. Some of the close course uh, started taking off, and that took away a lot of the racers um, and a lot of the clubs and stuff like that. So clubs that used to have a really good presence in in hare and hounds and and duros, all of a sudden were more focused. You know, they, especially because they could take their kids there, and it was a way easier event to kind of corral your kids at. Right, Logan. Yes. How did you start racing? Um, Grand Moran Pri and then Grand Prix. Grand Prix. So it was yeah. kind of desert races at the beginning, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Grand Prix are easier for dad, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Because you can both race. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but anyways, so that that was the kind of what happened. And I, I don't know if it can ever come back to to that level because you just don't have the space to make you know fun interesting courses i mean it can still be done uh but like anything and especially if you've ever been a race promoter which i have you can go out and bust your ass and build the best race course 
possible for whatever you're designing it for. I was designing it for stupid people that want to ride extreme enduros. And the only people that really wanted to come up and talk to me were the ones that were telling me how I did it wrong, how I didn't know what I was doing. And it was a very, very thankless job. So you imagine all these, and I was getting paid to do this, by the way, not much, actually not nearly as much as the bikes I destroyed uh, making those courses, but it was some money. I was getting paid. District 37 clubs are volunteers. And when you start calculating, you think that all this entry money, oh yeah, they're they're raking it in. Most clubs would go broke on their own race. I mean, they literally would deplete their their club funds because when you start paying, you know, paying for the insurance and you know the associated costs with it, whatever they were reimbursing, if anything, to the club members, um, the cost of permits, uh, if they got fined on the permit, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on just makes it really, really difficult. So the next time you go and complain (laughs) at a race, I'm talking to you racers that are out there. And this is what I used to tell guys that come up to me, you know, they'd come up and they'd tell me how I could have done it better. And I said, you know, that's a really good idea. So when you put on your race, you should implement that plan. That was my number one response to, to those people. But generally I was talking to the racer's mom and she had no idea. She was just kind of really bent that her son like missed a checkpoint or her son didn't get preferential treatment that she thought that everybody else got except for her son or, you know, whatever. And it was just like talking to a wall. So, Hey, enjoy being a race promoter. I don't know if it's ever going to come back like it was, but if it does, um, uh, good on them. I, I, I still have an open offer for any district 37 club that would like me to put on the th- third loop of their hair and hound in Lucerne Valley uh, I will put on the third loop for you. I will I will do all the work myself. I'll mark it. I'll arrow it and ribbon it. I'll do it all by myself. Probably won't be that long. Uh, or if it is, it's going to just go to someplace, and then I got I got a section for you. It's all It's all virgin. Not even King of the Motors has seen it yet. So, um, okay. Uh, I answered Victor's question. You see Todd Kelly's question there? Are we on yes. the same page here? Because it's Facebook treats us differently. You're probably, you've probably got minor restrictions. Dad's probably put some restrictions in there. So if somebody puts a bad word in there, <laughs> you don't get to see it. Um, hey, Jimmy, I'm re- rebuilding the motor of my 2016 Christini 450 after it kept getting stuck in, in between gears. I know how you feel about more power. Just twist the throttle more. But the motor on the clone 450 is a little lacking to loft the wheel, which you suggest just keeping it stock and for reliability or just what's your take on possibly a higher comp piston or maybe the 450R head. Any bad experiences with hot rod cranks? So... Uh, so he's talking about a, a Christini 450, which is a clone of the 2000, and I'm going to get my years wrong, but it's around that. It's a, the 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 pre 2000 and boy, I can't even remember the years now. It's it's the CRF 09 was when they 08. I think they started 06, 05. No, 05. No, now I'm thinking it's 05, 05 to like 19 20. 18, 17, whenever the RX, the R, the other, the new X came out, 19. So it's 18. So it's, it's 05 to 18, I think. Ray Conway, where are you at? <laughs> where's, where's my, my media guy that used to answer all these questions? So it's a clone of that motor. If I had a, a, a stock Christini, I don't think I would start modifying it for power right away because I, I'm pretty sure that you're just going to start finding weak links. And, you know, so if you put a high compression piston, you might find that the stock crate can't handle that. Um, If you fix all that, you might find that the clutch might not be up to it. You might find that the transmission might not be up to it. So if you're looking for more power, what I would honestly do is I would start searching around for uh, actual Honda 450 motor because I'm pretty sure that that would drop in there. And maybe you can find one that's blown up, you know, has some issues with it. And then you could actually replace the parts on that uh, to do it. Although I haven't, I haven't 
tried to hop up a Christini 450. I have one. I haven't tried to hop it up yet because I'm still trying to get it to just run better um, with the fuel injection, the new one's fuel injected, to try to get it to just be tuned better because I don't think that it's lacking power for that type of riding, for the type of riding I would do with that bike. Um because I could always turn the throttle farther, like like you said. So, um, I but I have had no bad experiences with hot rod cranks. Um, I don't know if I would do, do anything with you know like high compression pistons and stuff because then you're chasing and yours is a 2016, so it's carbureted. And I don't know what carburetor you have on there, but I think the carburetor replacing the carburetor would if you already have a different exhaust. So carburetor and exhaust would be your first steps to power in that motor without going inside the motor and doing other other stuff. Um, but if I were rebuilding it, I would rebuild it with, you know, good quality parts. And since they're all Honda-based parts, you're probably going to be in good shape, even if you're using uh, aftermarket. So, uh, hey, let me know how that goes, by the way. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, in how that works out for you. So Eric Featherston says, CD boots are the best out there. Wear a smart wool stock, cool in the heat, warm in the cold. I think Eric has told me uh, CD boots are the best ones out there before. And he says he doesn't get them for free and he doesn't work for them. <laughs> I wear CD boots most of the time. Do you know who Kel Postel is? Um, you don't? No. He's a guy that comes over here like two or three times a year with a flat tire. He really is. He, he rides with his dad. His dad's Pete Postel, and they go on rides. And Pete always has to bring him here because they're out of tubes and they've had like six flat tires when they're riding, you know, between their place out in the desert and our place out in the desert. So, Kel, what does Kel want to know? Uh, do you think enduro timekeeping will ever return to popularity on the West Coast? Would you like to see more traditional traditional timekeepers and rally racing in Nevada and California. Ask the Logan if he knows what riding a possible means. Well, Logan, what is riding a possible? Riding as much as possible? Mm Mm-hmm. See, Cal, he knows. He absolutely has it. Um. And to answer your question, I don't see timekeeping, uh, coming back or getting popular uh, just because it's extra equipment and, and you kids, not Logan, of course, because he knows what riding possibles is. Um, you're, 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 you're don't want to do the work. You don't want to put the work in to, to do these, <laughs> these endros. Uh, it's, it's complicated. You have to learn all these rules. Uh, I wish rally would kind of grow in popular. I think you kind of substitute with, you could substitute competition, timekeeping and endros with, with rallies, but you would have to do the rallies in open areas, which is difficult because with land use, we really can't do, you know, true rally competitions, but you could do them. I think it would be kind of fun to try it. Actually, a club like Training Wheels, which puts on these really fun family enduros um, that, that are still timekeeping, by the way, a lot of them should, somebody should, actually, I should go do one for them. I don't have time. <laughs> so, uh, but um, so Logan, you want to know what riding a possible really means? Yes. So it's it's an enduros. Back when I used to race enduros, we used to. <laughs> how, how far back do we want to go? So this thing called a roll chart. It was this little thing about two inches by two, you know, four inches by two inches square, and it used to have a minute and a mileage on it. Okay. And depending on what speed you were going, any time a m- even mileage fell on an even minute that would be a possible check. So you had to ride at a certain speed. So for instance, every at 24 miles an hour, every minute you would go four tenths of a mile. Does that make sense so far? Yes. So for every four minutes, you would go a mile. I got that one right, right? I'm going really pulling, I, the, the, the two brain cells are literally at fever pitch rubbing in the back of my head right now trying to. So when you go to, when you go to 12 miles an hour, all of a sudden, there's a possible every. Oh boy, this is where this is where it gets tricky because so th- no wait, thirty six was thirty six was a, a possible every three minutes. 
So anyways, there's, there's, there, you, you would have to remember all this stuff, but they, so there's all these, so you, you, you they would tell you, and a lot of enduros were just straight 24 miles an hour. You had to keep 24 miles an hour. And all of a sudden they make the train so technical that you couldn't keep 24 miles an hour. Yeah. I hated 24 because there was a possible every single minute. I liked it when it was a weird speed that you would have a possible every six minutes. And so what you would do is you would, you would, you would sneak up on that possible check and if it wasn't there, you know, you'd be riding what we call hot because you got penalized for going too fast. Oh, yeah. You, it was it was is it was way more it was way worse to go too fast than it was to go slow. If you went fast, you lost two minutes for your first minute, and then for every minute above that, you lost five minutes of time. Wow. And if you if you lost one minute, you lost one minute. So it was yeah. way worse to go too fast. So the idea of riding possibles is when you. You ride up to the checkpoint and it's not there. You have six minutes before there's going to be a check. So you haul ass, and but you can only go to the mileage where the next possible check could be, and then you have to slow down. You have to. You, you couldn't actually ride up there because you can't stop if they see you stop. So you yes. haul ass up to it, and then you wait for your minute to catch up. Your time would catch up to you, and then you would. Say okay, is there a check there? And there's not. And then you would go to the next, the next possible check. That's what riding possible is. Hidden checks. Oh. Yeah, the checks are the checks were hidden. Yeah. So now you're interested in riding enduros, huh? A little. A little. <laughs> so and and then and then as I got older, they had these things called pacers, and so you could actually program your pacer to show you what mileage you should be at at whatever time. But it, when you had a pacer, you still had to ride possibles. You had to know where the possibles were because the pacer would tell you where you should be. So you'd race in front, and then your pacer would catch back up to you, and you'd go through the possible. But then they had these other things that were computer, actual computers that showed if you were ahead or behind. And so you you could – you know, the idea was – and the computer would also show you where your next – it would do the math for you, show you where next possible was. So you could race up just before that possible and then stop and wait for your pacer to catch back up to you. Yeah. And then you would go again. So the crazy old days, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that made uh, racing a little bit more interesting. Um, Troy Hicks likes the fat front tire, but I only have one eye and no depth perception. <laughs> Boy, Troy, that's a selling point for fat tires. I don't know what else is. <laughs> um, uh, so Eric Featherston asks, you got that one? Uh, Jimmy, do you, what do you think the future of rally racing is in the Western United States is? Um, is Morgan, is uh, Mason still on the, the chat room? We were going to check up on Mason. So Mason Klein is a young kid who I am working with on some rally navigation training, and uh, he I saw him pop into the chat room, and we're gonna see. You got to check to see if he gets in there. I'll keep track of the other stuff. But uh, Eric, the the future is kids like Mason. Honestly, um, it's kids that have taken an interest in it, um, and with Ricky Brabeck winning the Dakar this year, for sure it spiked up um, some attention here. In the United States, I don't know that we'll ever be able to do it here in this country just because of land use issues. Uh, most of the, the rally races that you know are on this continent are down in in um, in uh, Baja or in mainland Mexico, and it's just uh, it's just difficult with all the regulations and things like that. So I think it might get kind of popular. Um, it definitely can be done on you know at, for fun with your friends. And, and we kind of have a unique little group of guys that we go out and we make rallies for each other and and we practice on them and um, because it, it's like we were just talking about that enduro racing. It's a, it's just a different way to enjoy your motorcycle. And the best thing I can say about it is when you're when you're doing rally, you can ride stuff that you've ridden before or maybe stuff that's kind of boring and it becomes fun because you're distracted with having to navigate where you're going and uh, do what you're, you know, do what you're doing, do what your road book tells you to do. But um, I think it'll be a little bit, um, it's always going to be a little bit nichey. Uh, but especially if maybe some more of the car teams kind of get involved and try to go over and do it. But those guys are car life. Oh, they, 
these guys, they just, they, they think they can just spend money and magically do good at it. And they don't realize that it takes tons of practice and dedication and training, training, training. Um, you can't just go and mash the pedal and yell at your navigator because he doesn't know what he's doing because it's a team inside the car. And, and until it gets popular in the four-wheeled thing, I don't think it's really going to grow all that much just in general popularity, which, you know, it's kind of a self-feeding thing. You need sponsors and all different kinds of stuff. So um, if it's funny because I've told any of the car teams that have contacted me about rally training how much work Ricky and uh, Andrew Short uh, guys have done to get to the level that they're at, you know, training that I did when I was doing it, training that Chris Blaze did, that Jonah Street did, that, that, you know, to learn how to navigate. And that's, you know, we were already fast motorcycle racers, but to do that and learn how to navigate is a whole new ball game. And just because you're a fast driver doesn't mean you don't know how, need to know how to navigate. You have to know how to navigate and your co-driver needs to know how to navigate because I guarantee you that Nasser Alatia and Stefan Peter Hansel are A, just as good of a driver as you, B, they can navigate better than you, and C, their navigator is way better than your navigator. So how are you going to beat them? Oh, just throw money at it. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Mason is here. Mason's still there. D ask him if he learned. Mason, did you learn anything? <laughs> did did what I just say make sense? By the way, to Mason, <laughs> he'll know. Uh, Dimitri wants me to answer his dumb dirt bike question. Do you know what that one is? Dimitri, you got to say his last name. You got to find it first, right? Um, <laughs> as a Elo? As a Elo, yeah, that's as 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 all as Elo. I think that's what it is. <laughs> What's his question? Hey Jimmy, please answer my dumb dirt bike question. Old versus new. Outside of pro racing, how much better? the latest dirt bikes really are versus say 10 to 15 years ago. I've seen the good, the good old CRF 450 X with a carb use to good effect as recently as two years ago in some high level desert racing. And that's a design from 2005. See 2005. <laughs> Can you talk about what you think for an a amateur weekend warrior, newer bikes really offer versus old school stuff? Well, newer is generally better. I mean, they're just more refined. Um, just, it, it, you know, they're not as worn out and stuff like that. But if you, if you were to take, if, in my opinion, if you were to take a – bike built in the 2000s I think except for top level racing you know we're talking like you know advanced intermediate up a rider could outride the you know a rider can it would the riding ability would overshadow any advantages you would get from buying a newer bike in other words you don't need the latest greatest Stuff would it help you? Maybe a little bit. I find that every four years in a model, except for ones like the Honda that has been around for you know fourteen or fifteen years or whatever it is, there's a significant jump in performance. Like if you had a two thousand and I'll use this as an example, a two thousand and eight KTM, and then you got on a two thousand and 12 actually I should shift to the year 2009 2012 because I'm talking about something I know specifically there is a huge jump in that bike um, because they made a big model change it was one of those ones that that had a big change but every four years or so roughly you'll see some sort of change that's that's perceived as better and it may not be better the first year that bike comes out because it's a change and it's different. And it's not what you're used to. So if you're used to that 2009 and you hop on a 2013, you're going to go, oh, I don't know if I like that. It. it feels a little bit unstable. The power is this. that It's not the same as what you were used to. But two years farther down the line, everything is switched to that 
level of, of whatever the direction is kind of more like the direction is going, but I still have some 2000 and four and five motorcycles that I could take out and race and they would do just fine. They wouldn't hold me back that much. Um, so to answer your question, uh, especially the Honda 450X, there are a lot of riders still to this day that like that better be- bike better than the new one. They like the old carbureted 450X. There's certain traits, stability, instability that it has. There's certain handling characteristics that it has. I'm not one of them. I like the newer one better. But there's other guys that just say, I cannot ride my new bike as fast as I was able to ride that old bike. So, um, Dimitri, uh, I, I think... It's not a dumb question. It's a really good question. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, if you're comfortable on a bike and it's good, uh, it doesn't matter what year it is. If you're comfortable and it's good, you're good. And if you don't know any better, <laughs> probably don't ride something new because you might like it. Or if you spend some time on something new, you get used to it. And then all of a sudden you realize how bad the old stuff was. And and what I find when I ride the old bikes Brakes. Number one, the brakes have gotten way, way better. We've never really had a lack of power, but we've had a lack of brakes. And then when we talk about power, it's not more power, it's drivability. Kind of what Honda was talking about with their their CR450 yes. today. Drivability. They, 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 they really do work on it. It really does make a difference. And then you're going to notice handling characteristics. Now, the suspension definitely improves, but that's that's – most people screw their suspension up just by clicking it or not clicking it or never getting it serviced. But suspension improves. But it's brakes, power delivery, and then handling characteristics have changed. Not to say that it's better or worse. It's changed. That's the difference between new and old, I think. I like fuel injection. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Paul Van Hoyt has a 2050 Husky FE 350 S S what does he want to know? Um, do the changes on the new model warrant an upgrade intermediate skill and advanced years 63. So are you an advanced skill and intermediate in your years or what? (laughs) Um, so you, uh, like I said, three or four years and you'll notice a difference. So we're at 2015, we're talking about 2019, 2020, you will notice a difference. The new, the new 350 will feel lighter and it will definitely feel like it has, oh boy, this is a hard one because the, the old 350 has flywheel torque and the new 350 has crank twisting torque, if you know what I mean. Bob, you know what I mean? You know how your bike feels like it doesn't have a flywheel in it? Your 350. It's really tractable. It's but yeah, it doesn't feel like it has a flywheel in it. Oh, okay, but it's still tractable. But it still has torque. Yeah. It doesn't have that chug chug chug. It just goes. Urgh. Does that make sense? How's that sound? <laughs> Does that, did that sound do it? I mean, this is this is a podcast, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So instead of going tuk tuk tuk, it goes. Urgh. Okay. That's the difference you're going to feel. Plus, the bike feels a lot lighter, and then all the little refinements just make you think. At 63 years years old, you got to have, you know, all that money you saved up, and uh, you just go buy another one, <laughs> right? Just like Bob here, I just got to. I just the problem is is he's going to go buy that old Husky 430 automatic stuffed into the new Husky chassis, and he's going to chop apart two perfectly good bikes to make it somehow and spend a lot of money. And he's not going to buy a 2021 bike and I'm not going to be able to buy his 2020 on the cheap. Don't I owe you for the last one I bought? Yeah. Yeah. we got to work on that. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Victor says the Husaberg, Sp- <laughs> what? <laughs> Husqvarna? Spartan 390 wheels may fit the KTM 390 adventure bike. Um, Victor's going to do that. <laughs> uh, George is going to answer that comment. Um, now we're getting into the chitter chatter. What's the next good question, Logan? Because um, this, this tequila is really, really good. Thanks, uh, Mason's mom, Lisa. I saw her. Lisa uh, popped into the chat room. Um there, there were some questions. Oh, I know where they are. They're on the, they're on the sheet. Go ahead. 
Um, Jeffrey Wa- Wafo. Jimmy, thanks for a great show. Seriously, considering the Honda f- 3 CRF450L or RL as of 21. Okay, so you got to stop right there. So you, you, so you did your homework, right? Yes. The CRF450RL has two major changes this year. I need the I need that game show host oh. ding 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 song. Two major changes this year. What are they? Two major. The the clutch. No 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 the 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 CRF four fifty RL. Yes, not yeah. the clutch, but I mean clutch, but not exhaust. No, and no uh, 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 there are n- very little changes to no change to the bike except for oh, two. No, two changes. Like um. Uh, no, you're not. Allowed, just, you guys zip it over there in the peanut gallery. I gave you homework. Okay, yes. you're gonna get. You're, you're right now. You're skirting on D. <laughs> you're skirting on D. Um, and that's not to mention that 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 there is a letter. There's a big important letter in this change. R. Right. And so it's called a Sierra 450 RL, RL no. as opposed to it. That's. You just read that in the in the question there. Yeah. So what's the other big change to that and um, the CR four fifty X? The X? Yeah, they they both have the same big change besides the bold new graphics, which I never count as a change. Um it starts with an H. Oh, the starts with an H. Hudson Clutch. <laughs> See the what? kids? They're all into the flash. He's sitting there. All he stared at was that Sierra 450 RWE, the works edition, which does have a hints and clutch. Yes. You, you didn't drool down to what the old men were looking at. <laughs> uh, sorry, Jeffrey Wagyu, you know, who's now considering the Sierra 450 RL. Handguards, Logan. Handguards. Yeah. Handguards. I, I wrote a whole sentence about that in the in the the thing I sent you. <laughs> uh so okay go ahead california um, as always i'm in california so a factory plated bike is important most of my riding is in the desert i know this bike needs a few things to wake it up but what are the your thoughts on the suspension because it's so similar to the 450x i'm assuming it it should work well. I would. How would you compare it to the KTM and Husky with the Explore suspension? Between the last name is pronounced Waftal. Yeah, see, he did that for us. Waftal. Yes. Jeffrey Waftal. <laughs> I never would have got that. Hey, uh, sorry for calling you old there. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm old too. Uh, so your kind of, your question number one is RL or X. And in all honesty, since you're riding on the street, you pretty much need to go with the RL because you need that license plate. Uh, the, the engine changes, like basically the big change that we found was mostly in the muffler, uh, between the two bikes, because when we put the when we put the X muffler on the R, and we just swapped it straight away just to try it, it really woke the bike up, and it it seemed like it ran mostly like the X. Now, because it's that engine which has a ton of aftermarket available to it, and you could always go to jcrhonda.com and uh, JCR Speed Shop because those guys know everything about that kind of stuff. And they could get you tuned out to whatever power you would like. And I will tell you that last week I was out riding a rally and I was riding one of Johnny's bikes, Johnny's personal bike, actually. And it was a Sierra 450 X, not the L, but X. And it was 100% completely stock. And I was racing against Ricky Brabeck. You ever heard of that guy? Yeah. I was smoking him. <laughs> like I mean, like leaving him in my dust uh, because I started in front of him, <laughs> and uh, he couldn't get he couldn't get by me because he waited like twenty minutes to take off after I left, and then finally when he caught up to me because I was lost, which happens on on rallies, um, 
not because of my superior navigating skill. Um, I, I never was at a loss for power on that bike. And so even a stock 450X, so the muffler was was good and knowing that you can just swap the mufflers out and it's good. I don't think you're going to be hurting for power on that. How would I compare it to the KTM and Husky with the Explore suspension? Uh, the Honda, I would say, has a little bit more aggressive stance. So in the desert, like the way the suspension is set up, if I were going to say... I want to take a Husky or a KTM out, or I want a, a Honda out, and I'm going to try to go fast in the desert. I would probably lean towards the Honda in in that aspect. I think the suspension, the KTM is a little, little more set up for more slower, tighter technical stuff. I think the Honda is really good. And the, the X and the L, to me, seem to be pretty similar. A little bit of the weight on the L, the RL now, helps it be a little bit plusher, which is kind of a good thing. Uh, but once the suspension breaks in, I think you're going to be happy. And, um, yeah, they're, they're all, um, all those are great bikes. You're not going to go wrong with any of them, but, uh, uh, I, I'm glad that you gave us your name, Waftal. <laughs> um, uh, Victor is going to be a bad parent now. <laughs> is that what he's claiming? Oh, I don't see many young riders anymore. Eric Kudla, you did a great job at some point by organizing the youth series, uh, Eric says, or uh, Victor says. Uh, yeah, those were awesome. I, I enjoyed watching those. So what are we, uh, what's our next question? Kristen Renegar? Dang, I was about to order medium size 42 and they're out of stock. Uh, which which boots, Christian? <laughs> I, I missed that. Let's see. Um, and Eric Featherston, he says he pays out of pocket for his CD boots, so he's he's good with it. Um, and Robert is uh, greetings from the uh, – I can't say that word because there's a kid sitting next to me. The uh, – FAHQMC San Diego chapter. Hey, I saw the I saw the new logo for the Hawaiian chapter. I want to know who's in charge of those because I want to go riding with them so I can get one of those uh, those things. Um, Mason's got his whole family on this call. Yeah, yeah. Larry's there. Lisa's there. Let's see. I want to turn every enduro race into a rally. Thanks, Jimmy, for being able to help people like me uh, race awesome races around the world. Uh, and that's the thing. If you're thinking about rally, you are going to have to go around the world to race. So <laughs> uh, Robert wants a PBR and a lawn chair for this episode. Where where would you be enjoying this episode where you're not sitting? Are you walking around with your phone or <laughs> how, did, how does that work? Um, and uh, Troy Hicks. Okay, Logan, plug your ears for a second. Throwing money around only works in strip clubs. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and then Mason Klein comes in. He says he only needs $40,000 to go to his next rally. <laughs> well, Mason, it sounds like you're going to have to work in a strip club because that's where the money's flying. <laughs> Hope his mom didn't hear that. Um, let's see. Uh, people are looking to practice for rallies. Uh, they're chitter chattering. Janie's there. Um, and what's our next good question? Um. Oh, here, here. So, so Mason is actually replying to Victor, and this is good. As a past past youth racer, I believe it wasn't that the parents weren't bringing us the thing that the oval track sucked at the end. <laughs> Wait a minute. The oval tracks sucked, and the NAHA racing tracks were great, but at a certain point, if we wanted to do a circle, we would prefer a motor track. And now that District 37 desert races are either sprint enduros or a loop race, it's lame and boring and not what it used to be And when my dad used to race before me. So somehow he's saying that the, the tracks, the courses for the youth races went downhill. So that's, uh, that's his answer. We have more questions on this. I know we've, we cut yes. it short. Okay, hit the next one on that. We're going back to the... Uh, there. We're right here? Yeah, right there. Okay, yeah, on the nitro... Oh, 
So if you're wondering what we're talking about, since you're sitting at your computer without your lawn chair and you don't have a peebs, uh, I, there's a couple on our YouTube channel. There's a couple of uh, videos of me changing uh, nitro mooses. Uh, yes. Unscripted, in my grubby clothes, on my knees, on the floor. And here's the comments we got on those videos. Love it. I can do this now. Nitro moose on order. Thanks. By Rodney Stewart. So I sold a nitro moose. Yes. So by me changing that tire, I sold a nitro moose. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> um, chalk that one up to sponsorship uh, potential. Next. Um, Kathy Doyle. Doyle. You're a stud. I want to be just like you when I grow up. <laughs> Wait, did you did you edit that sentence, Logan? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> See, he's, he 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 doesn't even have to plug his ears because he because plug your ears. Uh, Keith Dowdle basically says I'm a effing stud. Yeah, he wants. Well, Keith Dowdle, you're probably older than me because I know who you are, <laughs> and uh, you you when are you gonna grow up? <laughs> so you're writing bad words that I make kids read on my on my show. They're not that young, though. He's heard his dad say it a bunch of times. Probably on the way over here. <laughs> Next. Uh, bogus friend, friends. I've never mounted a moose. Not sure if the rear would be better than the front. I definitely would need a lot, a lot of beer. Uh, to mount a moose? No, you use lube, not beer. <laughs> I mean, he, he was watching the video, so... I guess that's uh, <laughs> that's part of the problem. Uh, WSL. There were a couple of differences from the front tire video. One, lubing the rim. Two, gulps of beer. Again, thank you for sharing your years of experience. Also from WSL. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually make this educational as just opposed to making jokes out of it. Uh, so he he did point out that I that on one I actually lubed the rim, so the center of the dish of the rim. So the way that I do the moose, and you can watch the video to, to do this. The way I I lube the inside of the tire, and then depending on whether I'm using a new moose or a used moose, sometimes I will lube the center dish of the rim. And here's my reasoning for this. I know a lot of people lube the moose, and when you lube up the moose and you shove it into the tire, and generally it's a tight fit, it wipes all of the lube off of the moose, and then it ends up all over the place, not where it needs to be. So I put the lube inside the tire, and I'm very specific about how I do this. You can watch it in the video because I just do it live, and I drink a beer or two. Um, then since... When you put the the mostly dry moose on there, any any lube that kind of squirts out or starts leaking around, I'll grab it, and then I'll rub it on this on the center of the moose that's now pretty much still dry, unless it's a used moose, then the moose is pretty lubed up. But what I would do is I take some additional lube and I'll run it around the dish of the rim. So where you know you would tape over the spokes, or you have the rim tape over the spokes, I'll put the lube in there. And you think about how a tire is going to spin. It's going to force the lube out to the outside of the tire. So I don't necessarily want all the lube on the outside, like center of the tire. I want it up on the sidewalls because it's going to get its way forced down over time. But I'll also put a pretty good quantity on a new moose in the dish of the rim. But I'm kind of particular about how I do it because I don't want, when I put the tire on, I don't want it to push the lube. I want to keep the lube inside the tire. And sometimes I'll even do it, uh, you know, before I drop the tire the moose down on the bead. There's lots of different ways, but you can see how I do it in the in the video. So that's why I lubed it. And in one, I was using a used moose, so I did not need to lube the rim, per se. And the other one, I was doing a new one, and that's why I did it. That's what the difference was between those two videos. Um, WSL, now I th think I can do this, although for a few... The first time, few times, it would take me a bourbon, one scotch, and one beer. Thank you for sharing your experience. He doesn't even know that. <laughs> See, you've, you've kept you've kept him somewhat no, sheltered. No, yeah. Really you, you know George Thorough good? No. No. <laughs> Maybe. 
Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's ancient history. <laughs> okay, we're just gonna go, we're just gonna glide right over the top of that one. Next question, Logan. Um, Ethan. Brutal. Uh, but about one tenth the cost of my truck. Rough take has me subscribing. That's explanatory. Super educational. Thanks, dude. Thanks, dude. Ethan, um, do, do you understand what he said? What's uh, about one tenth the cost of my truck? Yes. I think he was commenting on somebody else's video. <laughs> he didn't know my screen was up. That has nothing to do with. I mean, unless you know, it was super educational. Okay. Um, Paul Roberts, man, when I do this, my hands are bloody, and I've been hit in the head a few times. I've like the vice grip method. Um, most people uh, chastise me for the vice grips. They said, do you pay for your rims? And I'm like, yeah, I pay for my rims. I just don't look at them. <laughs> so, yeah, the vice grips are not the most effective method for keeping your rims pretty. Uh, have tire irons hit me in the head? Yes, many times. And I talk about it a lot in the video. And actually, at one point during the video, one does go flying. So um, uh, wear safety goggles or something like that. Uh be careful. Um, Brad Lou. Thanks, Jimmy. Getting the the first bead on the rim usually kicks my butt. Good to see how others have solved that tough task. Michael Barnato. So, so he's talking about so in reality, a lot of times when you're putting a moose on, you, you start mounting it onto the rim and the moose will not let the 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 bead of the tire go up into the dish. It kind of holds it off. And then as you're putting the rim on, it, it pops off the other side of the tire. In other words, the t it's like the, the, the two beads of the tire are so spread out, you can't get one to hook on to, you can't get it to hook on. It just, the little tire literally falls off the other side of the rim. So, so there's some techniques in there. Sometimes I'll clip a, a vice grip on the other side or put a tire on the other side so that rim, so that, so that it can't beat on, but mostly it's it's for me it's about balancing that that rim on the tire so that it that it hooks in there. So you know I'll do it so that I'm not actually trying to put the the moose into the center of the rim until the whole beat of the tires, and then I pop everything over sort of at once. You you, you tried changing? No, you didn't. You never put a moose on. I had you no. taking them off, right? Yes. How was that? Fun. Uh, that was that fun, like fun, uh, sarcastic fun. Yes. Yes. Okay. Next question. Um. Michael Barnato. First two minutes, I learned something. You're badass, and I think you know it. It all, but we don't. Thanks. Is he right? That he doesn't. No, <laughs> let me read that. First two minutes, I learned something. You're a badass, and I think you know it all, but we don't. Thanks. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I <laughs> thought what he meant was like you were full of yourself, but no. Well, he's right about that, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Is it okay? So he has two 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 comments in there. Yes. You're a badass. Am I badass? Yes. Oh, thanks, Logan. And I think I know it all. Why are you thinking about this? <laughs> Isn't it? I kind of know some things about some stuff. Yes. Yeah, and I, and I'm and I'm pretty. That's why I talk. Actually, people are like you just talk to hear yourself, and like no, I actually don't even listen to these. <laughs> so I'm not like that's no. That's why I have the earphones on, so I can't hear myself. But. Um, uh, no, I, 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 I'm trying to share this information. A lot of times it's funny because I, every once in a while I'm, somebody's doing something or, or, you know, and I, and I, uh, I should just walk away, but I see them doing it wrong or I see something wrong with their bike and I'll walk up and I say something and I'm not trying to be an ass, I'm trying to be a badass. I want to walk up and I want to, I want to help them. And the, the reason I'm saying it is to, to be a little bit helpful I have experience. I probably, whatever they're doing wrong, I have probably done before. Yes. So that's the, that's the, the, 
the help helpful part. So yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a uh, know it all badass, which is great. I just I need to get a T-shirt with that. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a logo made. Uh, so next question. Doug Derby, where is your stand? Did I have you use in the stand when you were doing the, the tire change? Uh, the the moose? The char- tire changing stand? Yeah, that's what he's yes. asking about. So yes. I have one, right? Yes. And he's wondering where it is. I was letting Logan use it. <laughs> I, I actually did it. I, I do use the stand when I'm just doing them. Uh, by myself to make it easier. The reason I did it without the stand is not everybody has a stand. And I wanted to demonstrate and show the technique to do it if you have kind of a basic minimum of tools, a few tire irons, um, maybe some very inexpensive special tools that I would tell you where you could get them if that company sponsored the show um, that clip on and make the bead go down, but you can buy vice grips anywhere. Uh, and if you really don't want to scratch up your rim, you can always put some uh, pieces of old inner tube down and clip it on top of those. Uh, but um, <laughs> I don't buy my rims, evidently. I just get them for free, and then you clip it on. But Logan got to use the stand, and uh, it was a little bit easier. Yes. Yeah, because you can you can use the stand to lever the bead down and put yeah. the clamps on and all that stuff like that. So I do have a stand. Maybe I'll do one with the stand sometimes. Uh, I could tell you what stand I use, but if that company that built the stand were sponsoring the show, I would tell you which stand I would use. And there are some stands that work really good at changing mooses if you're going to do that. But another thing I've told a bunch of my friends, if you have a riding group or something like that, you, know, you have five or six guys, here's what you do. You guys will all go in and buy the tire changing stand. Don't say you didn't learn anything at the show if you don't take this advice because I do this with all special tools, cam chain breakers, case splitters, stuff like that. Go in with your group of riding buddies on tools that you're going to use that are expensive and get it together and buy it as a group. And especially with tires, since you kind of ride together and stuff like that, you all buy new tires and new mooses at the same time. And then you have a tire changing party. And you're going to find that dumb guy that's kind of like me that knows that you guys don't know what you're doing and they're going to show you how to do it and they'll change all your tires for you with that new machine that you bought. And then you're going to learn how to do it in case you ever have to do it. But since you all put them out at the same time, you all wear them out at the same time and you have another party and you get that same guy again and then he's 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 ripe on you now. He knows that you're going to do that. And you say, oh, I remember last time you did it in 17 minutes. I bet you can't do it in 14. And he'll show you and when he doesn't do it, he'll have to do it again and again, you'll get all of your tires changed. So you know why I walked away when I was trying to teach you how to change tires, right? Because I didn't want to show you how to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note, uh, I'm going to run back into the forums real quick and see what we got. Um, uh, my comment earlier, Christian says, was about the skivvy socks with out of stock. Would you have sold some socks tonight? Uh, I'll... I you I would have sold some socks tonight. You know, I'll sell you my socks because we're running out of budget here, and we we couldn't even afford tacos tonight. So uh, my used skivvy socks are now for sale for the price of tacos for next week's Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. Logan, how do you think that sounds? Great deal. Great deal. Um, and Clint Chu, about four ounces or so in the tire while using Murphy's tire soap. Do not use Murphy's tire soap. Keeps the moose lube longer. Been doing it for years with zero issues and long life. Okay, your experience for you works. And I, he's at, he's talking about adding four ounces extra of Murphy soap to the moose lube. This is what I'm gathering from his comment. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I think it'll mix in. I think it'll. I think it'll. It, it's not going to join. It's going to mix in. Here's the problem with the soap. Soap doesn't like water, and it, I don't think it has a, as a high of a temperature point as the the lubes, and the lubes are getting better. In fact, Nitro Moose has a new lube that was shipped out with the, the new tires. I don't know what they call it. They had a fancy name for it. Uh, and since I can't tell you how it works, um, oh, wait, four ounces of water. What? No, 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 Clint. No water in Murphy's soap because you're actually – diluting the soap down and making it it might spread out easier but when that water evaporates it's going to take some of the soap stuff out with it and you're in for a world of uh 
uh, bad times. Unless your experience proves me wrong, and if it works for you, I'm going to say keep doing it. But I used to use Murphy soap, and I used to melt mousses, and so I stopped doing it. Uh, I had better luck with Vaseline, but I also melted mousses, so I stopped using it. I started using the mousse-specific stuff, generally the one recommended by the manufacturer, and I had much, much better success. Even though I don't know what those chemicals are, they could be Murphy soap or they could be uh, Vaseline for all I know. Uh, I would think they're more like KY jelly, but I didn't have any of that laying around (laughs) to test it. Um, Okay, I should have said plug your ears, Logan. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, is that it, Logan? Should we wrap this show up? It's past your bedtime again? This show's turning into a two-hour affair these times. Yes. It's because we're getting way better questions. By the way, thanks, everybody, for joining in. Um, Thanks for sharing. Uh, We do have a lot of big plans uh, for Dirt Bike Test. I've been uh, busting my ass, kind of sending out some ad proposals to some different people. We have a couple of really good ideas, uh, stuff that – to make this thing a little bit easier for all of us to do, which means uh, have people be able to afford to produce content for us because it's been a few of us in our spare time. Uh, Sorry I didn't uh, give you a cold call, George. Uh, (laughs) I was going to give you a call and ask you a couple questions, but uh, anything else? What are you going to wrap up the show with, Logan? Are you bummed there's not a new CRF 150R? (laughs) No? You're 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 wondering Which? where Honda's 125 two stroke was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> where 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 are you at with all that? Mm-hmm. And uh, Victor says if we had class A as well, we'd keep it going. Uh, no, we wouldn't. <laughs> I'd still shut it shut it down anyways. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thanks again to everybody. Uh, Logan, you're doing better. We got We got to practice on the homework though. Yes. So so this needs to be memorized next time. So you get to read it right now. So where 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 do we get KTM from? In Europe or America? Uh, well, they 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 come from Europe. They come from yeah. Austria, Matikhofen. So <laughs> you you start reading, and I'm going to interrupt. You just keep going. Um, powered by a distinct ready to race mentality, KTM is the world's leading high performance street and off road motorcycle manufacturer. Based in Matikhofen. Austria. With North America headquarters based in Marietta, California, over the years, KTM has built a reputation as a fierce fierce competitor on racetracks around the world, and the brand's remarkable global success is reflected in every product it develops and every move it makes. Kind of like hiring a young Jimmy Lewis in 1989 to be a factory 125cc desert racer. And with that, folks, we're going to say cheers. We'll see you out on the trail. Bye.